Welcome everyone on a sunny Tuesday afternoon. It's sunny at least where I am. My name is Judy Chan. I'm an education consultant from the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology. Today, I'm very happy and excited to have invited my colleague, um, Bo Sam Kim. She's also a um, learning designer from the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology. And also Mina Kailo um, from Arts, Faculty of Art, ISIT. And I'm so happy to have two experts who knows about student peer evaluation of assessment, peer assessment, um, to join me um, to share what they know um, with you, uh, with me and with everyone here. I would like to acknowledge that I am facilitating this workshop from my home in South Vancouver, the tra traditional home of the um, Squamish, Coast Salish, Stilatup, and um, Muskegon people. And I would also like to share a recent learning that I have about from BC campus. I registered for a course on indigenizing our cur curriculum. I, I learned about this framework. This is just one symbol that I pick out from my two-day workshop. So it has a lot of information there about the individual, community, spiritual, emotional. Um, this is one symbol to remind me how I may take little small steps to bring indigenous um, ideas, indigenous way of learning and knowing into our, our course. I don't claim myself to be an expert. Like I said, I only attended a workshop for two days. Um, but I would like to include this graph here. So I would like to learn from you and share this with you and hope that I can learn with all of you on how we can um, bring indigenous way of knowing into our curriculum and our courses. So just a symbol here to represent my, my, my learning and hope to learn from all of you. So next we are recording this session. And again, feel free to raise your hand. Um, Zoom has a latest update. I find it very user-friendly and it makes it very easy for me as the facilitator to see your hands, your reactions, or unmute yourself anytime, just speak up. We, we wanted to have a dialogue. We don't want to talk to you or present information to you. So anytime when you have questions, type it in the chat or just unmute yourself and speak up. And then next, like I promise, we are going to find a way to know who you are and try to engage you. So we have an activity here. Um, we would like to know why, why you are here today. Okay. Do you have any burning questions? What would you like to know about peer assessment? So use the annotation toolbar. It should be use your mouse and hover around near the top of your screen. You will see a green bar, have a, have a move around. And next to the green bar, you will see annotation. Yeah, you have to see, see view option, drop down menu. There's something called annotate. Use a T, the T symbol will be the most, um, most commonly used. And then you can type in there the text and say, tell us what you would like to know about pure assessment. So I'm slowly seeing a few questions. Rubrics for peer review, training, helping, helping the students learn how to use peer review. Why, why we use peer assessment, how to encourage students to participate and be engaged. I hope the answer is not just saying that let's assign some mark, you know, make sure you do it. You do it and you earn that 10%. No, I, I hope that's not the answer. When find some meaningful way to engage our students, how to improve quality of pure assessments and how to balance something. Sometimes it's hard to use the annotation tool because it breaks up our sentences. How to choose among peer assessment tools. So yes, Mina, many people were here to look for tools and some of the ped pedagogy explanations, why, why are we doing this? And a little bit of how to do it. Yes, how students use peer review. I'm just going to wait for a few more seconds. So for, yes, and just to, 
please finish your sentence. We will take a screenshot. And so to keep a record, and we will, I think, we hope that by the end of the workshop, you will gain a sense of what the tools are. Um, and, and, and listen to Judy on how she used one of the many tools. Okay. So I'm just going to grab a screenshot from my end. I think my co-facilitators are also planning to grab a screenshot. And then we would see who has a better screenshot, who has a better photography skills. Okay, thank you very much for sharing your questions. I, like I said, I'm, I'm confident that we are able to deliver some of the answers for you, but may not be in, in enough details. Over to you, Bozam, and don't forget to introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Bo Sung. I'm an educational consultant specialized in learning design from CTLT. So I'd like to discuss a student peer assessment in terms of what, why, and how. Uh, over the past years, I was lucky to be involved in a number of student peer assessment projects. And I'd like to say that none of the student peer assessment I was involved in was the same in terms of what we are asking students to do and then how we expect a student to provide feedback. So that is why uh, it is important for us to know what kind of peer assessment we are talking about. So Mina, next, please. So what a student peer assessment? Next, please. There are two types of student peer assessment. The first type is often used when you have some group work. Uh, this is when you ask your student to review their group members' contribution and collaborative behavior uh, to a group work. So this is a great way to promote individual accountability in a group project. Another example, uh, another type is having students review the actual product submitted by their peers. So let's say that you have the writing assignment or multimedia project or oral presentation where you see the value of having student review and provide comment for their further improvement. Mina, next, please. Uh, in a traditional way, uh, students submit their work and uh, students use a rubric assessment criteria uh, created by their instructor and use, it, use the rubric to provide feedback on the work of their peers. That's the traditional way. There are some specialty cases. What I mean by special uh, it's the same that students first need to submit their work, but there are some twists on how you expect the student to provide feedback. For example, instead of filling out uh, the rubric form, you may want to ask a student to provide annotated feedback directly onto the product, like on the timeline of the uh, video or the PDF document. That's some special case. Or you may see the value of having student actually compare the work of the peers. That's another specialty case. Nina, please, next. Uh, that's one way that we can take a look at the student peer assessment. Another way that we can take a look at the student peer assessment is in terms of the timeline when you want your student actually do peer assessment. If a student provide feedback on the draft of the student work, that's the formative way. In this case, student will have a chance to use, use the feedback to improve their work for final grading. If you ask a student to provide feedback on the final submission that will be summative way of using student peer assessment. Next, please. So here, 
I'd like to ask your input on why you want to use a student peer feedback, student peer assessment. Please use the annotation tool uh, and then share your pedagogical reasoning or some other reasoning that why you're interested in student peer assessment. So we can use the left side of the screen for the uh, peer assessment on process in a group work and they use the right part of the screen on the use of the student peer assessment on peers product. Yes, uh, group member accountability, individual accountability. Uh, that's really important pedagogical reason of using student peer assessment. And encourage self-assessment and feedback loop. Yes, uh, when we use student peer assessment on product, students have a chance to get multiple feedback from their peers. That's unlikely if the, in a large classroom, for example, it might not be uh, possible for the instructor to provide feedback on some task. Yes, mimic how scholarly writing and publishing uh, the work. The feedback loop is very important for a student to understand. Always there's some room for improvement in one's work. So we will have like one, uh, one or two more input from you. So for a summative purpose to help a student improve final product and to get used to a growth mindset around writing. That's really a great point. That's really important pedagogical reason. So bring diversity of opinion beyond the instructor's view. That's really important too. Uh, yes, they can see examples from their peers. So they can see what's working and what's not working, some strengths and some weakness, and then they can bring those experience when they try to improve, improve their own work. So when we ask a student to participate in peer assessment, actually it helps students understand the assignment better, the expectation about the assignment better because they actually use the rubric assessment criteria when they evaluating someone else's work. So that's great. We are going to take a screenshot uh, of this. So research says that uh, peer, student peer assessment actually increase a student uh, autonomy of their learning. So it's actually them to improve their work using peer, support, uh, peer feedback. So here are some tips that I'd like to share. These are the basic tips, but also very important for a successful implementation of student peer assessment. First, if you decide to incorporate student peer assessment into an assignment, uh, you have to plan your uh, student peer assessment with care. What it means that when you implement it, it creates more tasks for a student to complete. And inevitably, it creates more submission uh, like the, the date they have to submit. There are multiple deadlines for the initial submission, for the deadline for their peer work, a peer review, and then for the, for example, if you're using the peer assessment formatively, there's another deadline for the summative evaluation, as the final work. And you also need to think about how you can re, uh, structure your grading structure uh, because you want to acknowledge student completion of the each step. So 
in our uh, slide, I provide a link to the peer assessment planning worksheet. This is a template that you can use when you plan your SPA. It has multiple elements that you really need to think about. So it will help you not miss that important element in your planning. And in our previous activity, we discussed why we want students to engage in peer assessment. It's actually for their own learning. Students need to listen from you why you ask a student to do uh, peer assessment and then how it will benefit their own learning. Uh, this will help a student to get some buy-in about the peer assessment project. And the third point, third tip that I want to share is about training, especially for a novice student. Peer assessment, it's not something that they can easily acquire. Uh, inevitably, peer assessment, it means that you're asking students to do, have some peer assessment skill. And then if you are using some PA tool, students also need to know how to use the PA tool. So I would like to share some of the examples with you. The first example uh, is coming from the Department of Psychology. These two instructors uh, has some writing assignment and then ask a student to do peer review uh, summatively on the final submission of the work. They both had about over like 350 students in the class and then they couldn't find the time to train students in class. Uh, and since they are like novice student, uh, psychology 100 student, so they were quite new to peer assessment. And then uh, they didn't really have some confidence. What they found is that students have some low confidence about their ability to provide peer feedback. And then they also have even a lower confidence about their peers' ability to provide peer feedback uh, and peer assessment. So what, they, what we did is that we created this self-training module. It's about one hour workshop they, they can uh, do alone and where they can uh, get some detailed information about the assignment and then test their understanding about the assignment and the rubric. And also they have a chance to use the rubric on a sample assignment. And later uh, we help them uh, to compare their rating skills to that of the instructor and then have a chance to read the instructor comment. So, uh, through the research, we found that uh, this training workshop improved the student confidence as a uh, peer reviewer and also helped them build some trust in this peer assessment process. The second example on how a faculty train or provide some learning opportunity for a student to acquire some proper peer assessment skill uh, in this course, the assignment was uh, students need to practice their job interview skills. So we created some sample video of good and poor job interview performance and provided some sample feedback that informs students what kind of feedback that instructor are expecting from the student when they review peers work. The third example is actually the use of the student peer assessment on process in a group work. Uh, the instructor began the group work in class, actually assigned like 15 to 20 minutes for group team building activity and provided a work plan worksheet where uh, which students need to fill out together. So this kind of activity it's not really about the PA skill, but gave them some opportunity to talk about how they want to contribute to the group work, what kind of communication uh, norm they want to follow as a group, and then what are the some 
strategy that they can use when conflict arise. So this contribute to some common understanding about what are the good uh, contributor, good group member that they expect for this group activity, uh, group project. Uh, in and in many times, uh, student peer assessment require the use of the student peer assessment tool uh, to facilitate student peer assessment. So UBC has the student tool guide for all the tool that we support. Uh, so you can contact RTC or LT Hub to have some access to the student tool guide. And also it's a great idea to have some low stake practice uh, some assignment. Through this practice assignment, the student will have a chance to get used to the tool uh, and then look and feel the, some of the important feature of the tool. And also let a student know about uh, whom and how to contact if something goes wrong. Uh, the another point that the study emphasized is that we need to emphasize the written feedback. Uh, the study shows that students learn the most when they actually provide written feedback rather than just the rating. And providing some constructive feedback, uh, student, it, it may not be really easy, um, the skill that student can perform right away especially novice, novice peer leader, they tend to focus on the surface level of the work, like how to fix the incorrect grammatical errors, uh, rather than focus on logic of the paper. So you really want to share with your student, instruct them on how they can provide constructive feedback. So the peer assessment training workshop in the example one, uh, there is a section about critical and constructive feedback. There we provided five criteria uh, for the constructive feedback and shared some example of the, what are the, you know, the poor feedback and then how it can be uh, revised to be a better constructive feedback. And next, whenever possible, allow opportunity to apply feedback. So feedback is the most valuable when students actually have a chance to act on it. Uh, and it's totally fine to have some emotional reaction to some critics. It's a human nature. So students just need to hear from you that every work has some room for improvement and uh, how they can use the feedback to improve the work. For example, you may have some like guiding questions. In this case, uh, what are the reasons that you accepted this feedback and then what are the reasons that you are not using the feedback from these peers? Uh, and also if you want a student to use those feedback from their peers to improve their work, allow the enough time, adequate time for students to revise their work before final submission. And my last suggestion tip is about consultation and test. Mina and me, we are learning designer. We are very happy to get together with faculty who are interested in student peer assessment. We, can, we, are lo uh, we love to share some example from other faculty's uh, usage cases and discuss about the you know, potential tool that uh, can support the student peer assessment in your classroom. And you can also uh, like ask some advice to your teaching faculty in your department. There might be some faculty who has been using student peer assessment for you know, several times and then they will have some good advice and suggestions and test the tool. Every tool has some uh, features, different feature and some limitation and strengths. So whenever you try to ask student to use a certain tool, testing is really important. 
And lastly, these are the two really good resources on the student care assessment. The first one, it's a recent update from CTLT. Uh, you can check several UCD cases from UBC instructor, especially on SPA, on peer product. And RPICT also provide more in-depth idea and strategy on peer assessment through this link. So any questions so far? Then next, Mina will discuss the tool. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mina. Um, as Bosa mentioned, I'm a learning designer, Arts ISIT. So um, one of the things I became very interested in while working in learning design is the idea of peer assessment and how technologies can help. So I just wanted to go over the main peer assessment tools that we have at UBC um, and kind of just for a second, just stop and think about why peer assessment. So um, why peer assessment tools, sorry. So beyond just um, answering the need for logistics of peer assessment, like distributing the peer assessments, technologies afford just a few more extra um, features that add value to a peer assessment. For example, anonymity. It's really the only way to have anonymous peer assessments. It's also a really good way to guide students on each step of the process. Um, sometimes if we have a, a peer assessment in person, perhaps, instructors can't be there for every stage with every student, but by using the technology, they can build in instructions or directions if the technology will allow it, which some of the technologies I'll talk about will do. The other thing that um, peer assessment technologies offer is clarity around um, actual student activity and action. Um, Bosun was mentioning the importance of um, incorporating feedback and reflection. Um, you can add components like that into many of the technologies. So to encourage students to actually use the feedback. Uh, so instead of an instructor suggesting it, a technology can be set up to make sure students do that before they consider the assignment complete. We'll, um, in a second, we'll look at how this looks for each tool. And, um, and, and in addition to that, I just wanted to talk about how, again, so um, these tools will just basically guide students on each step of the process. However, um, technology always has roadblocks. Um, one of the biggest ones when it comes to peer assessment is the fact that if we're introducing students to a new technology as well as a new activity, it can be a little bit challenging. However, um, a little bit of what to build on what Bosun was talking about with, with um, explaining the use case to students, it's the same with technology. If you're going to be using a technology for peer review, especially something that's different, it's best to explain to students why, to increase their buy-in. Um, as well as one of the recommendations I make when people are just starting out with peer review is to start simple, is to start with a tool that you feel really comfortable with. And then after that, you can advance on to something else, depending on whether you want traditional or, or special peer review scenarios. So I'm going to be talking about um, peer reviews that are often used for just student output. Um, so Canvas peer review, Compare, Peer Scholar, and the Collaborative Learning Annotation System. All of these are UBC supportive. All of them are free. Um, Canvas, peer review, of course, Compare and Peer Scholar are all, all integrated with Canvas. Um, the Collaborative Learning Annotation System class is integrated with SIS systems. Um, you can integrate it with your Canvas course by adding the link, but it's not as smooth as Peer Scholar, Compare, and Canvas peer review are. So, I'll start with Canvas peer review, partially because if an instructor is just starting out with peer review, this is a good place to start. So here's a screenshot from a, a fake student. This is what um, a Canvas peer review would look like. You would have the student submission here, the feedback here, and the feedback can be given in the form of annotations. And I'll show you in a second what the rubric looks like. So this is a platform that's familiar to students as well as instructors. So if you're going to be starting out with a new activity like peer review, it's a good idea to start on Canvas. Um, in addition to the fact that uh, Canvas will allow for multiple, almost any submission type for students. So it'll allow for multimedia um, blogs, as well as just the file uploads or, um, uh, sorry, writing or images. So all of those are possible on Canvas. So here's just a screen grab of what the rubric looks like. 
So even though there's multiple ways to give feedback on Canvas, it is very simplistic. And, and this um, ultra simplicity also means that it's hard for instructors to provide a lot of guidance to students on each step of the process. Basically, if you're going to be using Canvas for peer review, you have to make clear to students on the main assignment page what the expectations are, when they need to hand it in, when they need to complete it, um, all those different things. You have to have that kind of set out clearly from the beginning. Um, there isn't any tools within the Canvas peer review that will allow that, that to be communicated to students. Just for example, you can't set a deadline on when the peer reviews need to be done. You just have to communicate that to your students. So on one hand, Canvas is a great place to start. On the other hand, um, it doesn't, you have to, you have to compensate for the simplicity of it in many ways. That also means that a lot of instructors who are working at higher levels of students, um, second, third year, fourth year, they often like Canvas peer review because at that level, students have already gotten training often times with peer review and they don't need those extra instructions that first and second year students might need. So the next tool I'm gonna to talk about is also integrated with Canvas. This one's called Peer Scholar. And it's a little bit difficult to talk about Peer Scholar sometimes because it just does so many different things in peer review. Almost any peer review, traditional peer review um, context you have will be answered by Peer Scholar. For example, Peer Scholar will allow students to review groups as groups or as individuals. Um, in addition, Peer Scholar has outlines every different stage of the process. It allows for submission, assessment, self-assessment, reflection on the assessment, revision, and instructor grading. So any part of the peer review process, any part of the assignment can happen through Peer Scholar. So um, it's very simple for students and it's a great tool for students. Um, on the instructor end, there's a little bit of um, practice that they have to do. Having said that, Peer Scholar is set up to be very user friendly. Like if there's something that you have set up that won't work, it'll send you an error message. For example, by default, your create phase, if it, if it overlaps with your assess phase, it'll send you a little warning. So in it's complex, but at the same time, it makes sure that your assignment is set up to be really clear to students. Before I go on, one more thing I wanted to mention, there's so many things to mention about Peer Scholar, but in terms of the types of feedback that, that can be given, Peer Scholar allows for open-ended feedback, rating, Likert scale, stars, um, drop-down. So um, you can have different kinds of ratings, not just strongly agree or disagree. You can um, outline the exact type of rating. So if there's anything that any tool, if you feel like is limited, it's a good idea to look at Peer Scholar. So just for example, I just wanted to really quickly show you what I mean when I say that it guides student activity. So this is a page where students are doing the assess phase. So they've already handed something in, now they're assessing it. So what's really great about Peer Scholar is here, if you click this, instructions pop up on that exact phase. So when students are handing something in, they have instructions. When they're assessing, they have a separate set of instructions. So these are generic instructions, but you can edit this to fit your context. So in addition to these verbal instructions, the way that Peer Scholar is laid out really guides students on how they should be thinking about the peer review process as well. For example, here, here's the first peer review, peer one, here's their second one, peer two, and then there's their own. So they're kind of um, encouraged to look at each, um, each submission in relation to each other. So instead of just blindly giving scores to this person and blindly giving scores to this person, they can change and compare as they work through. So Peer Scholar is very thoughtfully laid out. Um, it's, it's very hard to find anything wrong with Peer Scholar. It's just, uh, it just makes peer, it makes peer review almost um, foolproof in some ways. So um, the next tool I'll talk about is something about compare. Um, but I'll just take a second, if anybody has any questions or if anything's not clear, um, I'll just take a second so people can just go ahead and ask if you have any questions on anything. 
I know I'm going through things a little bit quickly, but um, I can we can share resources on how to find out more about these tools as well. And as Bosang was mentioning, one of the best things to do when we're thinking about peer review tools is to just meet and talk. Hi, Richard. Did you want? I think you can unmute yourself if you want to. Uh, you have your sure. hand. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, thanks for all this. Very helpful, all of you so far. Um, can you set up uh, either of these Canvas or Peer Scholar for peer assessment for group work? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. um, okay. How does can that kind of work? Okay. Canvas can't. Canvas is ultra simple. Um, actually, you can, but I won't tell you how because it's too complicated and it doesn't okay. Peer Scholar is excellent for that. Peer Scholar, you can have groups reviewing each other's group work, right. or you can have individuals reviewing another group's group work. Um, any kind of group configuration you have, you can do it on Peer Scholar. If you're talking about the actual um, rating of group member participation, you can also right. do that on Peer Scholar. Yeah, that's what I mean. If they're working in groups and 25% of the grade is how much they contributed to the group, would that be a good platform to use? Um, there's one drawback to that is that the Canvas integration does not sync the Canvas groups with Peer Scholar yet. So if your students are um, upper level, uh, I'm sure you could use Peer Scholar for this. You can rely on them to go in and assess the right group members. Um, if they're first or second year, you might want to consider the tool that Judy's going to talk about, which is called iPeer. Okay, thank you. I hope on the horizon that they will have an integration between Canvas groups and Peer Scholar, but unfortunately not yet. Okay, so the next tool I wanna to talk about is Compare. So when we're thinking about training students for peer review and guiding students through the peer review process, this is one of the better tools for that. So what Compare does is it encourages students to consider more carefully how they're rating peer submissions by comparing them with each other. So this is a sample of how it would look. Here would be one student submission, here would be another. Instructors have set up these criteria. And so students rate their peer submissions in relation to each other. So here they would say, which is more insightful? They would choose answer one or answer two. If you, oops, sorry. Uh, if you have enough answers, um, these are called answer student submissions. If you have enough, you can choose the option to adaptively review. So how that would work is that the reviews that score higher are paired with other reviews that score higher. So instead of just students giving, as um, Bosun was mentioning, that surface level feedback, which, you know, this is a great introduction, because you'll have two um, papers next to each other that both have great introductions, you'll be forced to kind of consider why, why one is better. You're, it kind of forces students to think more deeply about the ratings that they're giving. In addition to guiding feedback, Compare also has that reflect phase. So it also has the self-reflection phase um, that's built into it and as well as you can revise and resubmit. So it's similar to Peer Scholar in that it lays out these phases well, and it's good for um, especially beginning peer review. Um, one of the drawbacks about Compare is that it's best for intensive feedback. So it's best for smaller chunks of work. You can use it for an entire essay, but the way I've seen it used most successfully is for say an introduction to a paper. So um, an introduction to a paper should have the thesis, it should have the main idea and the examples. So in Compare, um, because students are so focused on those two paragraphs, they'll be able to critique that better. So the last one I want to talk about is kind of the most exciting. This is called the Collaborative Learning Annotation System class. So class, if we're talking about summative versus formative feedback, um, class is definitely formative feedback only. It is basically an annotation system with features that make it useful for peer review. So um, basically how it works is students can upload media. This is an image. Um, and then they annotate the media and have discussions based on the media. So basically it encourages students to interact more meaningfully with their peers' submissions. I'm just gonna show you the really cool part of class, which is video. So this is the biggest strength of class. I don't know if there's a better platform for interacting and commenting on video than class. 
how it works is you would be playing this video. Oops, sorry, my mouse is too sensitive. You'd be playing this video. And then when you are ready to comment, you click here and then type your comment. Your comment would appear here. And then you can see the map for here. So for students, if this is their submission, they can go in and they can see from this comment map where people mostly commented and they can answer as well. So the thing with class is because it will allow you to have threaded discussions, um, it allows for students to really um, think deeply about the content that's being shared. Just so you know, you can make comments through audio visual as well. Um, but uh, if I'm going to recommend something like the most pedagogically useful is usually text because text by, by being forced to write something, students are considering and engaging with what they're writing as well as you can search for text. So if, um, if there's key themes that are coming up, um, you can search for them. So you don't have that searchability with um, audio video. So yeah, so those are the three main, four main tools I wanted to talk about, just Canvas, um, Comp Peer Scholar, Compare in class. Um, we can talk more about this a little bit later, uh, or if anyone has any questions, they can ask now before I pass it off to Judy, who's going to talk about iPeer. While we're doing that, I'll just share our matrix here. Hi, Krista. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to ask, are all of these resources found in the same way, um, or do we link to them in different places? I mean, question. I know Canvas is obviously through Canvas, but other than that. Yeah, um, actually a Compare and Peer Scholar are both external tools within a Canvas assignment. So you automatically have access to those. Oh, I see, okay, great. Yeah. Class, that's a good question. You do have to request for a class site. Um, I think most faculty support units, that's where you would just be writing to request for a class site. But Thank when you. you request for one, your students are automatically added, so. Okay. Okay. Okay, Judy. Yes. So Mina, you can quickly go through the slide. I will just click. I tell you to click, click, click. So um, my name is Judy Chan. I'm here to share my experience as an instructor using iPeer for teamwork. So we focus on that process. So remember earlier we talked about using these assessment tools for processes or for to evaluate the, the product. So I use this for process and how the students are engaging with each other, supporting each other in the teamwork. Um, so I teach in Food Nutrition and Health 200. It's a, um, a course that we, we offer throughout the year, but I usually teach in the summer session. And I, in last summer, I have about 100 students and uh, and the number ranges from 60 to 120. I have students working in teams and four to six changes every year a little bit, be dependent. COVID last year, I allowed the students go up to seven. It's, uh, yeah, so four to six students for each group, every team is slightly different. And then, um, so they engage, I just want to emphasize that they are in the same team throughout the term and they are doing a few different things. They, they do two stage exam, they complete some assignments together. They, um, they also end up with a final project. So there is a pro final project that is about 20 to 25% of the course grade that they meet. But there are other things, small things, and also, just, like I said, two stage exam that they are in the same team. So that team building is quite important for me in my course, and that's why I put them together throughout as the same team. And therefore, one of my major goal to use peer assessment is to have a feedback system in the middle of the term so that they know how everyone is engaging, who is doing more of the work and who's not doing the work. And I will talk about the work a little bit later. So there is a midterm feedback that I am not going to ask. I asked them to complete the assessment, but I'm not using it for grading. I'm like, take a look. I will show you what I mean by take a look. Go into the system, take a look at the feedback from each other. Like, 
do you see any complaint from your teammate? Is there anything that you're not doing enough? Are you hearing that, or you are, you feel that you haven't been contributing, but your teammates are actually cheering you on, telling you that you're doing a good job? So I don't use the midterm feedback assessment for grading reason. For the final assessment, final assessment will be done towards the end after they submit the final project before the final exam, and. I tell the students that they not everyone is perfect. Not everyone needs to be a leader. So I sort of say, if you can get more than 70% from your peer ass assessment, then your project grade will not be affected. But if it's below 70%, then I will adjust the grading based on the feedback. So I use the um, tools called iPeer. iPeer is one of the oldest, the longest um, standing peer tool. So it also has a 1990s look. And because it's also developed here at UBC, some of the buttons, oh no, I have to say, many of the buttons doesn't make sense. It's just so hard to find where to click as an instructor. But luckily for the student, it's a very easy process. I watch some of my students, I ask them, is that okay that I watch you, especially before COVID? Can I watch how you do the evaluation because I want to see that experience. So for the student, it's easy. For the instructor, it's quite clunky. Even for example, for this login website, they ask you to log in and then they have that CWL button. I always wanted to click on that button, but you don't need to click on it. It just put your um, CWL in the middle. Anyway, so if you want to use this as your student, um, your support staff to help you. Talk to Mina. Okay, next slide, I would like to show some of the interface. So I log in, once I log in, I will see all of the um, past um, assignments that I have. Um, so it's good to, to know what I've done in the past as a reminder, and it's easy to set it up again for the next term. Everything is there. And then to next, Mina, maybe. I can also see some of the assignments that I had in the past. Like I said, um, I had final peer review. I have a midterm peer review. All the due dates is there. I can see how many students completed my, my assessment. And what else? Next, just wanted to share some screenshots with you. So here, one of the good thing with iPeer compared, um, that is better than Peer Scholar is it's integrated with Canvas. So it's really easy. Once you created the teams or the groups on Canvas, you can pull them in or out. Um, so you can just directly have the same groups in, in iPeer. And then for there's a mix of different type of evaluations. There is um, um, simple um, Likert scales, then you can also have comment, group breaks, so different type of evaluation set up. And um, at the end of the term, at the end of the assessment, it's easy to export the, everything onto an Excel spreadsheet. You can review the comments from the student before you release them just to make sure there's no inappropriate language. Um, we can also push the grade to Canvas. So it's pretty easy. Like once you set it up, it's quite easy to use. Um, <laughs> but the setting it up is tricky. I, find, I still find it tricky. Um, I've been using it for about seven years now. And then the next slide, what else? What else do I want to show? Um, so there's many different type of tools, different type of assessment. And um, again, it has a record of all the tools I've used in the past. I've always used the mixed evaluation. Mixed meanings is a combination of rubric and comment. You can also set it up so that students can have a self-evaluation or not. Um, so, so different. It's, it's, it's quite powerful. It has a lot of tools. Um, those rubric. Yes, I think that's all that I want to share. I want to leave enough time for some questions. And in the in the mix evaluate in the rubric here, um, there's also a bank of all the rubrics that is available on on IPR that is available from from all the instructor who use IPR. So you can take a look at the bank and see which one you like and adapt them for your own use. 
What else? So there are 214 different rubrics. So this is my rubric, part of my rubric. I have six different category. I ask the student to think about if they're showing or are their peers showing any respect, their attitudes in the project, how much they contribute, how much they organize. I also have listening. Are they able to listen to feedback? Are they able to offer feedback? So those are part of my evaluation. Um, so this is a rubric and then at the end, so this is a rubric that I share with my students on Canvas, just to let you see, um, the students see the Canvas a rubric and the course outlined also on Canvas and then they just go into IPRA is the same thing there. So it's, there's no um, confusion, I try to eliminate confusion. Pretty easy to use, um, my I like it and that's it. <laughs>